Well, here we are. Today is the last day of our journey through the Bible as we complete the E100 readings. We began the biblical story in the Garden of Eden, where everything between God and humankind and, and creation, everything was whole as God proposed it to be. In the beginning, God's will, God's kingdom, were on earth as it is in heaven, until we humans decided to do things our own way, depend on ourselves. Then, things became broken. And ever since we broke trust with God, the whole biblical story has been about a loving God seeking to restore that broken belonging between God and us. Finally, in the story, God became one of us in Jesus to show us how to love, to pave the way to renewed belonging by giving his very life for us. And, and God's plan is that all this will lead to the day when Eden is restored, when once again God's kingdom comes and God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven, as Jesus prayed for, the day when we will all live in God's presence forever. <clears throat> well, in the last book of the Bible, John's Revelation, John offers the hope that that day is actually coming and that we will experience that place, that state of existence forever. So as, as we remember those we are missing on this Memorial Day, let's turn to that promise and hope as, as we read from the Revelation. This is a highlight of what it will be like. Reading from the 21st chapter, beginning with verse 1. And John writes, and, and then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And he was seated on the throne, said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. And then going on in verse 22, I did not see a temple in the city. Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it, Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Jesus talked about that day when, when God steps in to, to conquer evil for good and, and establish his, his kingdom forever. And we just read from John uh, that partial picture. So, so what about this hopeful destination we call heaven? Is it for real? 
And if it is, what will it be like? And, and who will be there? This idea that our spirit lives on in some dwelling beyond the grave is embedded in the human heart. Regardless of the culture that you live in or what age of history. The ancient Greeks called it Hades. The Vikings, Valhalla. People of Eastern religions are working toward Nirvana. Native Americans hope to roam a, a happy hunting ground. And we Christians talk of, of heaven. On the other hand, there are many today who, who scoff at the idea of heaven as an imaginary land of dreams that, that we have, have created to, to curb our, our fear of death and to give us hope for, for justice and, and wholeness. There are a lot of folks who, who, who look around and they're dismayed and embittered at all the injustice and, and heartache they see and experience. Uh, they see the hate in unrest and violence and greed and sickness of our, our broken world, and it keeps them from believing that God is loving or believing that a place such as heaven could ever exist. As the old rock song concludes, I, I swear there ain't no heaven and I pray there ain't no hell, just let me die naturally. Is heaven just a perfect place that, that we've imagined to, to bring hope to our fearful hearts? Don't you wish that you could just fling the door of death wide open and actually see what's on the other side of that door? Uh, the, the closer I get, the older I get, the more I wish that. But no, we, we can't actually see heaven, nor can we fully prove it. But we can hope in its existence with intellectual integrity. First, what about this inborn idea in most every culture that we live on in another world beyond this one? How did that idea get there? Why is there this common knowing in the human heart, this universal knowing that life goes on? Oh, this doesn't prove there's a heaven, but, but how do you explain that? And, and here's a theological argument. Our faith, Scripture, teaches us that the essence of God is love, that God is just, that God loves peace and wishes for healing and wholeness and unity among his children. But we live in in a very broken world, an unjust world, where hate and violence seem to be winning the battle. Children are abused. Violence is out of hand. Broken relationships leave a, a, a trail of shattered hearts. The rich get richer while the poor get poorer. Every night on the news we hear that someone's been shot, someone overdosed on drugs. So, so here's the argument. If God is love, and if justice and peace matter to God, if God promises justice and wholeness, then there had better be a time and a place where tears are dried and broken hearts are mended, where hurts and injustice will be made up for, where, where pain will be turned to joy, because those things are pretty slow in coming in this world. If my God is a God of his word, then there must be a time and a place of justice, restoration, and dried tears, and that's the very description of heaven that we just read about. Another evidence is, is the experiences of people who have, have been near death and have come back to tell about it. In, in recent years, there's been a lot of research in, in near-death experiences. And, and the reports of those experiences, uh, the, the common themes are emerging from a tunnel into light and meeting a person of light who, who 
emanates pure love and, and seeing their loved ones. And, and on several occasions, as, as I have been with a person while they're crossing over, I've had the strong sense that they were definitely in transition into another world. But, but the cornerstone of evidence is the fact that Jesus went beyond the door of death and came back alive with a resurrection body and was seen by many to show that there's more life, more to life than, than beyond the grave. No, I can't prove heaven or that life goes on. But I've got to trust that if the Creator shaped us in His image as His most special creature, the only one with a soul, and if God made us for the purpose of sharing love and belonging with Him and with each other, then there has to be more meaning and significance to our life than to be just a passing shadow, than to be just a wink in time. I, I can't believe that God planned for it, that we just struggle through life to have children and die so that they can struggle through life and have children and die. I can't believe that God planned for this to be all there is. So, if life goes on in heaven, what do you think it will be like? I mean, what, what if you're afraid of heights and you hate harp music? But, but maybe heaven's not at all like that. I, I think God must want us to, to be in anticipation and to embrace the mystery because usually... When Jesus or Scripture talk about heaven, it's shrouded in mystery. It's, it's in the abstract context of a dream or a vision full of symbolic uh, images, like in the Revelation. So, so what we see is not a clear panorama, but, but more like peeking through a knot hole. But, but there are enough bits and pieces, I think, to reveal some glimpses of life in heaven. First, I don't think that we will be disembodied spiritual blobs floating around the universe absorbed in the oneness of the force. Uh, that, that kind of afterlife would be like the aftertaste of garlic. I, I think that, that heaven will be more real than anything we've experienced or imagined. If there is any one thing we know for sure about heaven, it's this. We will be in the very presence of Jesus himself forever. Like we said, God created us for the purpose of sharing belonging with God. And in this life, when, when we take up with Jesus, we experience his power and presence in a spiritual sense in our heart, but I think that's just a taste. That's, that's just practice for the day when we live fully and forever in God's presence. Jesus promised, in my Father's house are many rooms, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and I will come back and take you to be with me. Imagine actually looking into Jesus' eyes and feeling his embrace, and, and hearing him say to you, welcome home. Uh, imagine the opportunity to thank him for his love, to ask him questions. I also suppose that we will be in Jesus' presence the moment of our death. Remember what Jesus promised to the thief, dying beside him. He said, today, not, not 2,000 years after cold storage, he, he said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Now, scholars argue as to what paradise means, but who cares? Today, you'll be with me. So the most basic definition of heaven is to live fully and eternally in God's presence. And, and if we could know nothing more about heaven, 
just to know that the one who died for us and forgave us so many times is, is waiting there, that's enough for me. But there's more. The Bible hints that in heaven we will retain our personal identity, recognize each other. When Jesus was visited on the mountain by Moses and Elijah, they were recognizable. The disciples recognized the risen Jesus. At the moment of death, Stephen saw Jesus. Perhaps we'll have the joy of welcoming our loved ones when they arrive or being welcomed by those who've gone before us. I have a hunch We'll get to know Noah and Mary and Moses and and Paul, and boy, do I have some questions for them. Uh, But hold on, there's more. The scripture indicates that we'll have a body, a resurrection body. Paul believed that the the feebleness and limitations of this earth suit will, will be transformed into a body like Jesus' resurrection body. In Philippians 3.20, he writes, and we eagerly await a Savior who will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Jesus' resurrection body had, had physical substance, but yet was in some ways different. He, he ate, they, they touched him, he, he bore the scars of the cross, yet they recognized him more by his personality and mannerisms than by his physical appearance. And he was in some ways really different, like appearing and disappearing at will. Imagine that, a a glorious body. I've never had a glorious body. Not even when I was working out, playing racquetball. If this means what I think, there'll be no beauty products necessary in heaven, nor will it be needed to have wheelchairs or prosthetics or handicapped parking places. My mother, who is tone deaf, will be able to sing on key. I will be able to roller skate and dance, and Lord knows I've tried it enough times. But, but better yet than, than restored physical, broken hearts will be mended. The betrayals and abuses and losses and injustices we have suffered here will be forgotten and replaced with joy. Today's scripture promises he will wipe every tear away from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. I love how Gordon Moat expresses it in his song. As he writes, on the other side of time, broken things are healed, empty things are filled, as we stand in heaven's light on the other side of time. And not only will our bodies and hearts be made whole, our our knowledge and understanding will be made complete. Perhaps one reason God doesn't always try to answer our deepest questions today is because it would probably fry our circuits. We couldn't handle it. Uh, The Apostle Paul explains, he says, what we see now is like looking in a dim image in a mirror, but then what we'll see face to face. What I know now is only partial but then it will be as complete as God's knowledge of me. And don't worry about having time to visit with everybody on your list, about getting out of worship service in time. Time will no longer matter, for we'll be on the other side of time. Have you ever tried to to fathom the concept of, of, of eternity? Every time I try, it hurts my brain. But, but let's try. Have you ever been to Lake Michigan, the, the mountain-sized dunes of sand and, and miles of beach? Well, that's just, that's just a tiny fraction of, of the grains of sand in all the beaches and deserts on planet Earth. 
Well, well, imagine if every grain of sand on this planet represented one year. By the time you've used up the last grain, eternity will have just begun. A, a verse in Amazing Grace says it well. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. What, what do you think heaven will look like? Will there really be pearly gates and, and streets of gold? What do you think it'll be like to live there? Well, we be able to enjoy there the things we most enjoy here. In, in Revelation 21, John describes the new Jerusalem from his vision as a perfect cube 1,500 miles high and long and wide, built of gold, transparent as glass, with walls of jasper, gates of pearl, foundations studded with various gems. The city will need no light save the radiance of Christ himself. No need for a temple, for God will be dwelling with us. Now, scholars can't say for sure what is symbolized by, by the cubic shape of the city and, and, and all the precious substances. But one exciting thing is clear. God chose gold to describe the pig iron, the, the girders, the pavement of heaven. So whatever heaven is like, the most precious substance known to us describes the construction materials. I confess, though, I, I've always hoped that the things I love most here will be in heaven. I can't imagine heaven without critters, especially dogs. I, I can't imagine heaven without, without fishing, without mountain streams. If I don't catch a muskie here and it doesn't look like I will, I, I hope to in heaven. But, but I have an idea that the moments here when we say it doesn't get any better than this, that those moments are only a shadow of what we will experience in heaven. I don't think we can even imagine. The, the contrast between this life and, and that life, I, I guess it will be like the contrast between a black and white TV and, and a 360 degree IMAX screen with 3D with surround sound. It might be like the difference between the inside of a cocoon and, and the springtime that a butterfly is born into. Uh, I'm guessing that, that when I thrill at a panoramic sunset that becomes more beautiful with each moment and tears come to my eyes, I'm guessing that God is thinking, Terry, you haven't seen anything yet. Who will be there? Well, everyone is invited. There's room for as many as accept God's invitation. God invites us all into relationship with him. And, and whoever grabs hold of Jesus' outstretched hand and tries to follow him can look forward to continuing that relationship forever in his presence. Now, you might be wondering, well, I'm not so sure about Uncle Harry. You know, we have a tendency to evaluate a person's faith, don't we? But thank God that's God's job, not ours. God is totally just, full of grace, and sees the faith and intent of a person's heart. And I have an idea that God will say yes to anyone who has said yes to what they have known and understood about God. In fact, we might be in for some surprises. Like, like the poet put it, when you get to heaven, you will likely view many folks whose presence there will be a shock to you. But keep it very quiet. Do not even stare. Perhaps, doubtless, there will be many folks surprised to see you there. <laughs> Perhaps I should just keep asking myself the question. Have I given all that I know of myself to all that I know of God? 
What a blessed hope for us and for those that we are missing this Memorial Day. What a blessed hope that that day is coming. That day when Eden will be restored, when the broken will be mended, the empty will be filled, injustice will be made up for, when God's will be done, God's kingdom come. That's our hope. To someday hear Jesus say, Come, blessed of my Father. This coming week, Pastor Chris will be back in the office. Uh, however, I have one more Sunday with you because uh, annual conference begins next Sunday, and Chris and Nicole will be in Lakeside for annual conference. Uh, next Sunday is Pentecost, the birthday of the church, and we'll be talking about what it means to be living in the age of the Holy Spirit. Now may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forever. Amen. See you next week.